mai hari mai ki te huihunga uh, kotahi nei, ko te kaupapa o tēnei rā, uh, te hauora o ngā tangata o Aotearoa, kia hia kai kore ngā tangata o Aotearoa. Welcome everybody to our first webinar uh, hosted between MSD and Kuri Hia Kai, um, our Just Kai webinar series. It's wonderful to have you with us um, to talk about our kaupapa for the day, um, Food Secure Aotearoa uh, and to look at food security and food insecurity. But first, we start with a uh, karakia. Kia tau ngā manākitanga a te mea ngaro. Ki ronga ki tēnā, ki tēnā o tātou. Ka mahia e hue mā ki, kihi kihi. Kia toi te kupu, toi te mana, toi te aroha, toi te reo. Kia tūturu, kia whakamaua, kia tīnā, tīnā. huie, tāuhie. Uh, ko wai au, uh, ko koukou te maunga, ko kai wharawhara te awa, nō te whanganui a te rā, aihi nō ana, nō ingarangi rātou ko kotirama, ko te ameni ngā whenua opu tūpuna, ko Malcolm Rowe, ko... ko uh, Mackenzie Oku Hapu, ko Trish Malcolmaho, uh, ko Hirikai, ko Kore Hiakai, Zerahanga Collective Tiropu or Oku Mahi, uh, Tena Koto, Tena Koto Katoa. I'm Trish Malcolm, I'm from Kore Hiakai Zerahanga Collective. We are an NGO working in the food security, food insecurity space. We have a dual focus of supporting and engaging with those in the community food space as well as doing that slow, deep work of addressing the root causes of poverty-related hunger so that all in Aotearoa might be food secure. It is our pleasure to have you with us today, and I introduce you to Neil Ballantyne. Yeah, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Neil Ballantyne tokoinga. Uh, it is absolutely fantastic uh, to be here and to welcome you on behalf of the Ministry of Social Development uh, Food Secure Communities team. Uh, hopefully uh, we have a relationship with many of you already, uh, but for those of you we don't know, uh, it's lovely to connect, at least digitally, via this webinar. Uh, my background is in community development and youth development, and I've been working with government for the last few years. And it's been a pleasure uh, to be part of this uh, Food School Communities project, uh, which has really come about because, um, because of COVID and because of the effects of, of the pandemic on our communities. Uh, what we noticed, of course, uh, as we went into the lockdown was if you could, you went to your local supermarket and you bought up all that you could because it was such a time of um, uncertainty. And so, of course, we saw our supermarkets running out of kai. Uh, but likewise, if you didn't have that disposable income, uh, what we saw was vulnerable whānau uh, going to community service providers, community kai providers, food banks across the country. And we saw that they were running out of kai very quickly. And so MSD... Uh, wanted to uh, put some support into that space. Uh, we did that initially um, with some uh, strategic funding uh, to keep some food banks up and running to make sure that food was getting out there into the community. And then uh, we knew that it wasn't going to be a short term issue. We knew that there was going to be a sort of a tail uh, to the pandemic and a tail to the effects on our communities. And so through Budget 2020, uh, we're allocated funding um, to invest in communities uh, initially to meet uh, the increased demand for community food we saw across the country, um, but then likewise uh, to invest into food security initiatives uh, that would actually build up um, um, resilience within our communities around Kai. And that's what this um, this uh, yeah webinar is all about. What the co-partner of this webinar is all about is to explore um, both sides of those coins. And as we've been out there. Um, managing, I guess, relationships uh, between government, between MSD and community mm -hmm. food providers who have received grants from us. Um, we keep hearing from community providers that they want to know what's happening in the rest of the country, that sometimes they feel isolated within their communities and don't necessarily know um, what other practices are happening around the place. And so, yeah, that was how we uh, got together with uh, Kōra Kai, had some conversation with Trish and decided to put on this webinar series mm -hmm. called Just Kai. And uh, you'd see from our material that we, we see these as a conversations around what good practices look like across the community kai sector. 
um, because we want to want to share really good stories and really good practices from across the country so that we can all benefit from that wisdom, benefit from those experiences. And so we're we'll running these about every two months. Um, this one being, of course, a bit of an intro um, topic into this food security, food insecurity kind of space. And um, but in future webinars, we'll go deeper um, into some of the very important topics so we can explore them in more depth. And we hope they're also an opportunity for you to connect with each other as well across the community. Um, just to let you know that this is uh, being recorded. It, um, it will be available afterwards uh, for those that weren't able to be with us or if you wanna go back to something. So don't, don't worry about if you've missed something, there'll be an opportunity for you to be able to go back and find some of those things later on um, to revisit the wisdom that is shared today. It's really exciting to be able to do this. When we first cooked this up, we were kind of wondering how this might look. Uh, and we thought, oh, we'll just do the first one and see how we go. You know, that first time you make a few mistakes so you can adjust for the next time. And um, we thought, oh, it'd be great if we could have maybe 20 or 30 people on the webinar with us. Um, but we were informed as we started that 174 people had signed, had registered today. So we know that that doesn't mean there's 174 actually on, because I know that sometimes I register for something and don't quite make it and I watch it later. Um, but it is incredible to have you all with us. And we just thought it'd be really cool if you could, along the bottom of your screen, is the, the, there are two buttons. One's the Q&A button, one's the chat button. If you just want to chuck into that chat function who you are and where you're from, that would be really awesome. It would be really amazing for us to see that and you'll be able to see who else is on at the same time. So I invite you to use that facility right now to be able to share um, who you are and where you're from in that space. And we'll just... Yeah, yeah I can bring okay. that up. Woohoo, here we go. Go Nikki, woohoo, Tessa, hello, welcome. Um, and so just as you're doing that, you'll notice that beside the chat function is the Q&A. So we're going to use both of those functions um, during this webinar um, to engage with people. Um, so the chat function we're going to use for just like open stuff so you can see who's on to so connect with each other and you can share some thoughts about things as we go. Uh, but for the Q&A function, that will be specifically for asking questions to our panelists. Um, so after they give their talks, um, they will be able to um, We'll select some questions from that Q&A function um, to give directly to those panellists. That's really amazing. There's people from right across the Motu, from uh, the far north all the way to Invercargill. Um, there's some people from Palmerston North, Rotorua, Twizel. It's just really amazing to have so many people from across our, our country um, mm -hmm. and, and having you as part of this corridor as we go. So kia ora and thank you for that. As they all keep speeding in, it's fantastic. Um, we thought that we'd just start with asking for some of your wisdom. Uh, and so again, with the chat button, and I know it might get a little bit mixed up with the where, where you're from, who you are and where you're from, but just to start with the question, what do you uh, think that food insecurity is? And just use a couple of words, maximum of a sentence, don't need a paragraph, just you know, a couple <laughs> of words to describe from your perspective what you think food insecurity is mm. so just chuck that into your chat button and let's see what some of those things are that come up by the looks of some of those names we do have some experts uh, and their attendees as well so i'm looking yeah. to see some of that wisdom coming through as well well can't afford food product of our current society limited to ac limited access to healthy food mm. um, barriers to ongoing affordable kai yeah some really awesome things coming through there Excellent. Unaffordable food. Mm. Can't get food when you need it. Feeling that you can't feed your whanau. Mm -hmm. Mental health uh, uh, implications. Mm -hmm. Food budget not lasting for what is coming in for pay each week. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, it's Systemic systemic barriers. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, seeing stuff in the supply side there, demand side there, access side there all these structural things that can get in the way of people accessing Kai. Awesome. And so I'll ask you to do the same to think about what you personally think that food security is. Um, I often get tongue tied and slip the either in or the security in the wrong way, but to focus on what food security might mean for you uh, from your perspective and the whanau that you work with. So stability of food supply over time, lovely. Mm. Full cupboards. Mm. I can't afford it. 
enough, enough food for everyone. Yeah. Nutritious, sufficient dietary. Not worrying. Mm. Yeah, it's huge. Culture appropriate. Yeah. Information. Yeah. Regular access. Confidence. There's a good word in this mm. space. Sovereignty. Woohoo. Excellent. Don't do share screen for me. Certainly. So we just, um, we've been playing with a few things in Kore Hekai space. We know that we often use terminology and, and it gets flipped around a bit. And, and so we decided that we just needed to put some things on paper so that we knew how we were talking to each other. Uh, and I thought that we'd just share these reasonably quickly. There's quite a lot of words on the, on the screens, but um, I assure you, you can get access to this later on. So don't feel like you need to absorb everything that's there. And, um, and this just gives us a little bit of a brief introduction. So. When we first talk about food insecurity, it's not, have to click it for me. <laughs> there, there we go. Um, we had this huge debate uh, within our space about what food insecurity is really about. And we talked about temporary, we need to actually name temporary food insecurity mm -hmm. and that that's really important that if we name it and put it to one side, we can then actually deal with systemic. So temporary food insecurity is when there's something that shocks our world um, and that cuts us off from our access to food. So you might think about something like um, Kaikoura earthquake where the roads were blocked and the only way to get food was with the Navy coming by ship. And in those kind of moments, they're usually uh, some kind of a natural disaster and they usually involve government having a civil defence response. Um, and that response is never thought to last for a great length of time. Usually we talk about 12 weeks um, maybe slightly longer than that, but not any extended length of time. So yeah, if it'll move on, yeah. And so that was temporary. And then we talk about food insecurity, the reality of that as a systemic framework. And there are a whole lot of things that are on there that kind of feed into that space. Um, and the traditional response in this space has been largely food parceling, which again was a temporary response, but has become a long-term response uh, because of the systemic framing of that. And there are some other responses that have been in this space as well. And up until 2020, um, this space was never funded by government. So Neil started by saying we're in this place because of COVID and I'm sat next to him thinking, no, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> we were here before COVID and we will be here until we actually resolve this. But this is a reality that COVID highlighted. Um, and what's happened now is that now government have come into this space to work alongside us. We hope for longer term solutions. But what happens in this space, we use some other terminology as well. So we've got food-related poverty. Um, so we often say that food insecurity is just poverty by another name. It's the outworking of poverty in a way that affects food. So um, what we saw happen with the media with COVID lockdown was that they started using food insecurity as a term, a term in the media that they'd never used before. Before that, we talked about poverty or food-related poverty um, or lack of food experience because of poverty uh, and so this is a symptom of poverty the lack of being able to access food rather than the whole of it and the one that goes alongside that is that our response in that is usually what we might call food aid um, and we create systems where people have to come and um, get access to food in order to meet their food requirements and so you might think about breakfast and lunches in schools, uh, but when we took them off with COVID, we saw how dependent people were on various forms of community service in order to remain able to feed themselves in their whānau. And so quite often our response in that space has been around food dependency models. All of these things are really important because we want our whānau to be fed. So there's, there's nothing that's deficit in here in that sense, but it's highlighting that this is a systemic issue. And then we move to food security um, and when some of the beautiful words that you talked about um, when you shared your stuff about not worrying and full cupboards and not having to think about where food comes from mm -hmm. and that's really the essence of food security is access in such a way that it brings joy um, and it brings uh, the kind of lives that we want to live together and we're living our best selves. Um, again food security is not just about food it's about a resilient community, but it's about adequate housing, income, affordable food, all sorts of other things that go in there, including access to grow and, and knowledge to grow, Kai. Um, and alongside food security, and we often say 
is food security food sovereignty is food sovereignty food security are these two things the similar things really if we lean deeply into them um, next to food security we have food sovereignty which is our, our right to self-determine either as individuals whānau or as people um, and in Aotearoa, that food sovereignty is deeply linked to land sovereignty, sovereignty and our relationship to te tiriti or waitangi. So that's just a really brief um, kind of overview of, of some of the, the terminology in this space. Um, and it really helps us to kind of understand that what we're creating and what spaces and what our responses might be. So kia ora for that. Yay. Hmm. One of the things that yeah I've found quite interesting as I've been doing this work out in the community is that in some ways addressing food insecurity is, is kind of easy, right? Like you feed some people, <laughs> but addressing or building up food so uh, sovereignty or food security, um, it takes, it's, it's quite complex and there's so many different parts in, involved in the food chains and so many different players and aspects of, of what you could do within a community. And so, yeah, hopefully this webinar series can continue to share those ideas, share those stories about what food security looks like so that we can bring that back to our communities, bring that back to, to projects and pilots and plans um, that will really build that sustainability. So it's now my absolute honor and privilege to introduce our first panelist. Um, the Q&A button first. Sorry? Do you want to talk about the Q&A button first? Oh, yep. So just a reminder that as uh, our first panellist is speaking, um, you can start submitting your questions into the Q&A part. Don't put them in the chat because I'm not going to be able to see that. Um, but chuck them into the Q&A part uh, uh, module down there below in the Zoom function. And we can do that throughout and then I'll select some questions at the end. Uh, so as I said, it's my absolute honour and privilege uh, to introduce our Manawa Hine, uh, expert panellist, uh, Helen Robinson, who of course is the newly appointed Auckland City Missioner. Uh, she has a wealth of experience in the social services and of course a deep commitment uh, to making a more equitable Aotearoa. Uh, her background is in youth work and social work, um, but has had a broad range of experience working within the community development context and has always had a passion for supporting the excluded and marginalized people um, within those communities. Her most recent position before becoming Auckland City Missioner was of course as a general manager of social services at the Auckland City Mission and within that uh, her leadership roles included a focus on the mission's work around homelessness and food security. Uh, Helen has released research into the measurement and experience of food insecurity in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and has a commitment to resolving food insecurity, um, and has taken a lead role in the creation and implementation of Kōta Hiakai, so has a lovely connection there with Trish. Uh, so without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Helen uh, to speak to us today. Kia ora, Neil. Um, what an introduction. I'll bring you with me around more often. Uh, kia ora koutou whānau, uh, ko Helen Robinson tuku ingoa, and um, it's my genuine pleasure, I think, to be with you all here today. Um, when I was reflecting or preparing for today, um, you know, interestingly, we talk about whakapapa, and I think it's important that I, I kind of provide a whakapapa in the food space, actually. And uh, when you think about uh, your whakapapa, I think the question's often, how far back do you go? I think an important um, time in my life in terms of understanding both food insecurity and food security was in my time here at the mission. So I've worked at the Auckland City Mission for the last eight years. And um, uh, particularly in my first years, um, uh, over Christmas time at the Auckland City Mission, some of you may know, anyone who normally would come to us to access food would also um, uh, available to come to get a work and income benefit or a supplementary benefit and also some presents. So what that would mean is, is that during our Christmas period, we would literally have hundreds of people on the footpath. And uh, my first experience of those in my first years of actually being in my body, deeply shocked, being, being in that crowd and in that queue for people who were, despite our best efforts, waiting for five, six, seven, eight hours to get access to food that if I went and bought it from the supermarket that day would be worth about 60, 65 bucks. And um, when you're, it's a little bit like going the, uh, when you're in a crowd and 
part of that experience in your body, it affects you. And I think actually the, the truth of insecurity, food insecurity in New Zealand, for me, started in those cues because I was affected and affected in my body. And I was no longer able to ignore this reality that was in front of me. Now, at one, there was a critical moment one year where actually I was caught in the crowd and um, uh, it upset me so much that I realized that I had to do something about it. So I literally went back to my computer that day and Googled food insecurity in New Zealand. And that's, that's the rabbit hole that has begun this journey for me um, with the Auckland City Mission in terms of really saying, what is this reality that I'm seeing in front of us? Now, the corridor that we have today is, is kind of putting in juxtaposition food security and food insecurity. Now, it's not putting it in juxtaposition, but there is this conversation that says, actually, do we focus on the reality of food insecurity or do we focus on the hope or the vision of food security? And certainly the position that I've held is actually is a bit of a both and. So when I come to understand what is food insecurity, what I see is the face of people who are actually desperate to access a basic human need and right. And I have come to understand that it, that desperation doesn't have to be that way. So food insecurity is ultimately about that availability or access to food that obviously includes economic access now, the experience that I've had, uh, particularly in the last five or six years, and a little bit less so now, but, but going through into the future, is that many people in Aotearoa do not know nor understand that hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens are suffering the reality of not having access to enough income to get enough good food for them and their whanau. So that, that lack of understanding wildly shocks me, if I was honest, because I then go, can you not see what's in front of your face? But perhaps actually, if it's not in front of your face, you can't see it. So actually, what that has done has led me down a pathway that says part of my responsibility as being part of the mission, and certainly even more so now as missioner, is to help people understand the reality, the facts of food insecurity, that it does exist, it is part of us, and actually that it doesn't have to be that way. The risk, however, is that if I focus my and our energy always on a food insecurity lens, it means that all we are doing is working to address the status quo. And actually, the status quo is significant. I'm extraordinarily proud of certainly our organisations and many on this call today who do very, very good work to respond to that very real face of insecurity that, that is part of the reality of many people in our country. In the same time, and that kind of little colloquial saying that goes on all the time, if we always do what we've always done, we're always going to get what we've always got. And what I know that we need to do as a country, what I know the mission needs to do, what I know in our participation in Kurihia Kai, and with all our partners, is actually step into a food security space that says, here is the dream and the vision of our people. It is possible. We believe it to be possible. We know it to be possible. We've had an experience in countries and in our history of it being possible. What is it that we need to do to help that reality become possible? And how do we do that together? Because everything in my experience has taught me is that the nature of food insecurity is such a complex, wicked problem that it really requires all of us together. So that's certainly every bit of the food system and sector, including government and council and, and um, iwi and schools and churches and um, uh, the health um, uh, MSD, any, any organisation that you think the product, producers of food, the distributors of food, everyone needs to be working towards this possibility. Now that also comes back from a bit of a, an understanding of if there's any kind of social workers on the, the kind of line or health about a strength based approach or perhaps you might have an experience of a, an appreciative inquiry. What I do know is what you pay attention to, you will grow. 
so that I am certainly determined and committed at a very deep level to grow food security. And so that that means that, that we as a people and we as an organisation need to turn our attention to what is it that will grow food security. One important piece of that puzzle is to talk about the impact of hope. Um, part of the research that I and we did here at the Auckland City Mission is that we um, surveyed a group of people who were coming here for a six month period about their experience of being food insecure and we measured them on a, a number of different indices and one of the, the, the um, survey kind of components was to actually look at the impact of hope for people who were food insecure. Now, not surprisingly, and I've, I've even got statistical information to prove this now, the more food insecure someone is and the longer they've been food insecure, the least likely or that uh, they are to be hopeful about a reality to get out. So that it's, it's, it's deeply sad and, and, and sadly ironic that the nature of being food insecure diminishes the hope that is present in that individual and in that far no to move out and beyond. Now, because we have that information now, we can then start asking that question that says, well, what is it that grows hope? So what is it that grows food security? What is it that grows hope? And one of the concrete paths that we have is that we know that if we can work with individuals, far no community, country even, to begin to get some very clear steps, um, what's called uh, pathway thinking, steps to move from here and beyond. We grow that hope, and in doing so, we grow the ability for people to move beyond a food insecure reality. Now that focus on the individual does make me a little bit anxious because the biggest picture that we need to know is that it is us as citizens in our country through the decisions that we are making that is making people food insecure. This is, this is a structural issue uh, that has resulted in the individual, but it is also at the individual, the whānau, the community and the country level that we must address this bigger issue. So food insecurity, food security is about different seasons requiring different focus, ultimately an agreement that we know we must move towards a reality that is food secure, it's coming from or being sourced from a deep belief that it is possible and a knowledge and knowing that we are constructing a society that is food insecure and therefore we can construct a society that is food secure. Now I could go on for a long time, but I think now is probably a good time for me to pause and allow questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Helen. Um, I love uh, seeing both the journey that you've been on personally uh, around moving from sort of addressing food industry security to really focus on food security. Um, but I also love your big vision for that and about how we can all play a part uh, within that. Um, my first question to you is, um, obviously the Auckland City Mission has a really large organisation with a very long and proud history. Um, so I'm just wondering sort of how difficult it was or sort of the process you went through to get others on board. So as you're having this kind of personal realisation, how, how, how do you get the institution to um, see the importance of food security? Um, I'm aware that many of my colleagues are on this this uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, and and I have to tell you that um, I, like all things, I think change happens in the context of relationship. And I'd have to acknowledge that sometimes it is their passion and their desolation at seeing what we have seen day in day out since I think it was 1986 we opened our food bank that that with them has actually inspired me to say it doesn't have to be this way. So sometimes, Neil, to be honest, it's our frontline practitioners who've led me, not the other way around. And then you actually get into this very interesting dance, if I could even use that language, um, uh, about the reality of things and also how we can move out and beyond. I think there's two other things that, that are clear about this. We live in a world that requires evidence 
and um, uh, in the end, the evidence that we have is the, is the reality of the whānau that we are seeking to serve. And I knew that we needed to capture that evidence and put it in a form that could be, um, if you'll excuse the pun, eaten by others <laughs> or kind of received by others. So that actually part of that journey was actually getting some good evidence behind us. And that it was important to me that it wasn't me that did the research, that we did that research. Because in the process of learning, we learn together. And then finally, I do believe that leadership is critical that actually that there are key individuals at different times that actually must stand up and say, um, this is the reality, it doesn't have to be this way, it can be another way, and to, to lead people through um, uh, to an alternate reality. Thank you. We just have time for one more question, um, but can I uh, encourage all the participants online um, to continue to put those questions into the Q&A function uh, down below. And um, if we can't sort of pick them up right now, we'll try and pick them up uh, later in the webinar. Uh, so the next question is, someone has asked a question around how social harms or, or sort of things like alcohol, drugs and cigarettes um, can sort of, I guess, go against our work around food security and can sort of um, become prioritised over food um, for some people in vulnerable um, whānau. Is that um, something you can speak to at all? Totally. Um, the reality of food insecurity in New Zealand challenges um, at a very deep level what we think about ourselves as, as people who belong to this country. And when, it, when, when a challenge occurs, often what happens is we get distracted by um, stories that, that are in some instances true, but are actually not reflective of the core reality of the people that we are seeking to serve. Um, uh, in different forums and in different instances, I've stood up and acknowledged that I believe New Zealand has a problem with alcohol use. And in fact, we know that 15% of New Zealand has a, an addiction issue with alcohol or some other drug. And that that 15% is actually true for our whole population and is true for the food insecure population. But certainly on the evidence that we have, it's not more true for this population. And actually it's not less true either. So. Um, it's really, really important in this whole discourse and this discourse of change and challenge that we don't get distracted by conversations about um, behaviours that uh, uh, some people may say are not morally good behaviours, are morally bad behaviours, because what it does is load this conversation and it distract us, distracts us from the true conversation, which says that food insecurity is about a lack of income and that there are certain groups in our country who have a lack of income, particularly Māori and Pacific people, particularly women and particularly women raising children. It is not because of their alcohol use or cigarette use or any other use that they are food insecure. It is because of the reality of colonisation and racism and sexism that that occurs. So it's very, very clear so that this kind of question is often put to me that actually says, yes, it is a part of the reality of this population, but no more or less than it is for the rest of us. Um, so it's an important one to address, Neil. So I thank you, the person who um, asked that question. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for your time, Helen. Um, that's all we have time for for this segment, but we will be coming back to you uh, later on in the webinar with a few more questions. Really appreciate your sharing. Kia ora, Helen. Um, it is my great privilege to introduce our next speaker, um, Eddie Edmonds, who comes to us from healthy families in Te Awa Kairangi. Um, Eddie grew up in Te Awa Kairangi uh, and knows that Whenua really well um, and is deeply committed to finding ways for whānau to have a healthy life in, in that papakainga. And so it is my great pleasure to introduce Eddie who comes to us from the Healthy Families team uh, who are really about innovating spaces and finding different pathways so that we might find uh, holistic ways of going forward. So kia ora Eddie and thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, tēnā te nuhi nui kia koutou, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, te tāho tōku māma ko ngā tire kawa ki whare pūnga, te tāho tōku pāpa ko te whānau a whānui, uh, iwi. Um, thank you, Helen. Thank you for uh, everything you just mentioned. I agree with uh, your kōrero there. Um, anyways, everyone, I'm Eddie Edmonds and I'm the Lead Systems Innovator 
for Healthy Families Hub Valley. Um, where do I start uh, talking about going off Helen's board at all? Um, start with food insecurity um, as part of one of our initiatives or tasks that we um, started here in Hutt Valley was going out to speak to our community. We needed to really understand their lived experiences and um, a, a number of them stand out for me. Um, and, and just one example um, is, is part, uh, we heard things like um, there are multi-generation households um, adults are working several jobs and 90% of their income is spent on bills, um, amenities for, or household costs. Um, and what the sad thing about that was they had to prioritize who gets fed in this household. Um, and a lot of a lot of adults were missing out on Kai. Um, it's very hard to hear. And um, at, at times, the whole household uh, would miss out on kai. And we're talking households of uh, eight plus. Um, so when I started in the space, we, we thought we had a really good understanding of our community. Um, all these food insecurity didn't come up because of COVID. Uh, this was there before COVID here in our rohe or in, in our region. So it was important to um, listen to these lived experiences, uh, get them to try and build trust and get them to trust us. And then how do we utilize that knowledge or combine it and weave it with other evidence such as data, research, and then uh, value them equally just as important. I think the power is when we weave them together, um, it, it becomes, a, a, I guess, a platform for us to, or, or a starting point for us to um, think about ways we can change or ways we can make change for our community here. Um, I just want to mention from a Māori perspective, because everything Helen kind of covered for me, so my kōrero should only be short, but in my opinion, uh, there are elements of the past for Māori that we can revive to help reshape our kai environment in the future. And, and one of those elements is um, kaitiakitanga, or trusted guardians of the whenua. And as trusted guardians of the whenua, it's actually a responsibility for us, not just a, a beautiful word. There's a Māori whakatauki that says, uh, manaki whenua, manaki tangata, haere whakamoa, which means um, if we take care of the land and we take care of the people, we take care of our future generations. Um, and and when, we when we talk about whenua, or when I talk about whenua in this instance, it means uh, land, it means the kai environment, it also means our waterways and why. Uh, and I know this is just a kai webana, but that's just equally important. Um, another element could be mā tauranga, um, speaking about future generations, so knowledge, knowledge to grow uh, kai, māra kai, mahinga kai, um, hunt and gather our own kai, cook kai, our traditional dishes. Um, and that's just to educate our tamariki to survive. And in our community insights, we heard that a lot, a lot of the mātauranga was lost and it especially came from people with rural upbringings coming to the urban settings. Um, and that, that knowledge and that survival mode, so to speak, uh, sits with one or two people. Um, so our future generations or our generations coming through don't necessarily have that knowledge. Um, and we're talking about food sovereignty. Well, to me, an abundance of kai for you and your whanau and being in a position to help others is my definition of food sovereignty. And um, for me, if I was to put it in a catchy phrase, it would be something like, along the lines of from whakama to whakamana, or from um, some of our whānau that feel embarrassed, embarrassed to reach out for kai, uh, to empowering our people to learn how to grow kai, the mātauranga, as I mentioned. And another thing is mana. So um, when, when we're in that food security, insecurity state, uh, I don't have to look too far in, in, across my own whānau to see people that need help and um, which is sad, 
it's sad here in New Zealand, it's happening just next door. Um, it's happening just in the neighboring community. Um, and in Tawakairing, we specifically, we have pockets of food insecurity. Um, and, we, and that's predominantly in the communities with a high representation of Māori in Pacific Island. Um, and it's just, how do we bring that together? How do we bring, to, how do we bring our whole, all these agencies together to help out these people? Um, and I think it will be a number of different ways to tackle the system. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I called it. And um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. Kia ora, Eddie. Uh, wow, uh, that phrase from whakamata, whakamana, man, hit me here, eh? That's um, a, a beautiful challenge, I think, to all of us uh, to, to see what that can look like for our communities, because um, that's so important, eh? So important. Um, we have a few questions coming through, um, but I just uh, want to ask you first, um, what kinds of systems changes um, you're sort of seeing for your region? Um, what sort of uh, players or, you know, big structural players like council, that kind of thing, or small NGOs, when you see them sort of just starting to make some moves, what are some examples you're seeing towards that sort of food security? Yeah, so uh, COVID brought the kind of security to the forefront. Um, and a lot of organisations such as Kōkiri Marae, um, Health and Social Services down here in Seaview, and um, Common Unity Project Aotearoa. Um, everyone I felt, and, and I can only speak for our local experience, was less patch protective and came together to help out the community. So in ways, um, there's the Pātaka Kai, which uh, Teresa Olsen, leads um, th through Kōkiri Marae and they're one of our great partners, love working with them by the way. Um, it's a koha kai and it's unconditional there which makes it slightly different to a food bank but I know a lot of food banks are heading or doing the same thing now uh, and some of the systems change would be things like planting ideas, okay funding will most likely run out very soon so how can we keep this sustainable and um, the marakai and partnering with common unity and the likes of is one way to tackle that sustainability and not relying or being dependent on funding from local government, uh, central government. However, it's been very helpful in a lot of those cases. Yeah, kia ora. There's um, seems to be marakai all over <laughs> Te Awa Kairangi at the moment, eh? Like everyone's planting those community gardens and, and feeding their community, which is so cool. Um, we've got a few questions here. Um, how has uh, increases in housing costs affected whānau in your area? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, if I can again, I can go only on our personal experiences and local insights. Um, everything is getting harder, so it's important to educate our future generations. Um, with the housing costs or the rise of housing needs and to build new homes, I think it's important to, um, if we're gonna build in one section or one area, how do we free up highly productive land for our kind? Now, Te Wakairangi has a history of um, fertile soil for our kai here, Kumara, Taro, so is back in the day. Um, and a lot of that was kind of um, run by Chinese market gardens. And so then the increase of housing need happened there and they built houses on that fertile or highly productive land. So looking to our past, how can we learn off some of those decisions? I'm not saying they're mistakes, but how can we learn off that? So if we are building new houses, how do we free up our productive land for Kai? Awesome. And um, one final question, um, in terms of when you're doing your research and, and, and asking for stories and whānau and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, did you find it difficult to engage with people feeling that whakamā about, about sharing um, sharing their stories or sharing their experiences? And, and how did you sort of journey through that? Yeah, um, great reminder, Neil. Thank you for that. I just want to acknowledge all the people that we spoke to in the communities of Wainomata, Taita, Nainai, Pōmari, uh, Stokes Valley and the likes of um, it, it was very hard uh, we 
didn't really have a template. It was just going in to understand and making sure that their mana is intact walking in and also walking out of that room. So respecting them. Um, again, as I mentioned previously, respecting that lived experience equally with evidence such as data. Um, it can get quite emotional. So I came from 10 years of government experience and then coming into my first community-based role. And it was like, whoa, you know, it really hits you, the lived or, or the realities, um, which is uh, something that you have to deal with individually, something where you have to, it's hard, it's very hard, especially if you live in the same rohe, it's very hard to shut off of what you just heard from those interviews and you might just see them on the street or um, in the suburbs. So yeah, it, it's, it's a challenge, but it's something that, you know, I'd rather try and do my best and try and influence the system from many different angles uh, to help these people. It can get quite emotional too. Awesome, yeah, I feel you on that one, definitely. Um, I'm just gonna see if we can answer this one live. Maybe you can see that, it might be coming up on your screen. Um, but I thought this was just a lovely comment. Um, would you agree, Eddie, that Pataka Kai encouraged community kindness for caring and sharing within the community? I thought that was just a beautiful reflection and just wonder if your thoughts on that. Yes, um, yes, and when I talk about mana, so some, some of our community members are going in for Kai and they want to give back in one way or another. And so there's a number of different ways where you can volunteer out in this community spaces. Um, and that's why I think it's important to get on the back of community-led solutions. I think that we have a higher chance of it being more sustainable. But yeah, totally agree. Awesome. Um, I think there are some people who want to connect here with you, mate. So um, there's some requests for your email addresses. So you might want to put that in the chat at some point. Uh, but overall, hey, just thank you so much uh, for sharing your wisdom and your insights with us today. Um, that was really beautiful. Thanks, mate. Um, now we're going to bounce between Eddie and Helen and ask them um, the same question, but in the short term, medium term and long term. And so it, we get into these spaces and it's about what we can do and, and what's the next step. So the first question is, in the short term, what would be one thing that you would want to do in the short term in order to shift from food insecurity to food security? Helen, do you mind if I ask you first? Totally. I was wondering if Eddie or I were going to bounce back on that one. So, um, uh, the one word that sits deep with me, deeply with me, is shame. In the short term, immediately with urgency, we must minimise, reduce, get rid of the shame uh, 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 that people experience in being food insecure. There is no shame in not having enough money for food, and it really lands back on organisations like ourselves in terms of the processes that we are going through, do they actually induce shame? And what can we do to reduce and actually get rid of? It, it, shame is so sticky and so pervasive that it, um, it only brings harm. So we, we must get rid of it. Mm. Kia ora, um, I'll add to that, just what I mentioned earlier, listening to the community voice, uh, their lived experience, value their experiences as equal as uh, other evidence such as data. So I'm repeating, repeating, repeating here. Um, and, and the power is when we weave those two together, um, it, it just becomes a, a, a great way to create or start creating change for the need there in our communities. Kilda. So if we think about the medium term, and when I say medium term, I mean kind of in the next three to five years, 10 years max, what would be one thing you would want to see different or to do? Totally, I would um, uh, uh, spend time on value energised partnerships. Uh, so, so wherever there is a we, invest in the we. Uh, and, and particularly a we with Māori and a we with Pacifica groups. I agree with you, Helen. Um, high trust commissioning and partnerships uh, for community-led solutions. Uh, to put in other words, put the money uh, in where the need is in the community, invest in community-led solutions. Um, and sometimes, or most of the time, that's about us getting out of the way. So collaborating with these communities. Um, 
And when I say us, I mean local central government. And a, a small example could be um, pulling pull back on the reporting, because that's a huge challenge for a lot of our whānau that are looking for funding to help feed other whānau. And we are making it very hard, very hard for our whānau to fill out these application forms and then compete with other people trying to do, other community champions doing the same. Kia and then last one, long term. So we often say this is a generational shift. So within a generation and within a 20 to 25 year band, what would you want to see different? Um, income or equity across income distribution. Um, uh, food insecurity is about income and is about us sharing resources. Currently, some people in our society have and others don't. And we need to create a platform where there is much greater equity. And again, just to complement what Helen is saying, if we have the lived experience, if we have the high trust model, um, then we'll be in a better position to influence the system from all different angles, um, environment and access, income, time, mātauranga, as I mentioned earlier, housing, employment, um, and also that urban growth versus uh, food production. Sure. Um, so we've been grilling uh, lovely panellists uh, for the last 50 minutes, uh, but we'd now like to uh, turn it back to uh, you as the attendees out there, um, because we think these same questions are probably relevant um, across every organisation that we're a part of. And so if you've got time now, grab a pen and paper um, and potentially you know, do the same activity. We're challenging you to, to write down and think about what is a short-term action that you can take following this webinar that will enhance food security for your communities. And then next, we want you to think collaboratively. So what would a medium-term collaborative action look like in your community that would also enhance food security? And then finally, we want you to reflect on what your dream is. What is your dream for your communities uh, to create them um, as food secure communities? What does that look like? Um, in your area. And if you want, you can start chucking some ideas in the chat function as well. Um, so, you can, so other people can see um, what actions you're about to do. Um, that could be a really nice way to um, share some wisdom as well of what was happening across the country. And you may also want to um, take some time now also to think about who you might connect with and start talking about this kind of stuff. Because as we said before, we, we, we often find that people get a bit isolated um, when they're just working away in their little um, charity or NGO or whatever out there in the community and don't often get this chance to engage with like-minded people who are, are bouncing around the same kaupapa. So if you saw some people before when we were all doing that um, introductions at the beginning and you thought, oh, they sound interesting or they're near my region, maybe take some, take some time to try and figure out how to connect with them and maybe have a coffee in the next week and maybe you, you might better share those reflections with them. Kia ora, Michelle. <laughs> nice little action to share some of this. Sure. Community Fridge in Whanganui, awesome. Collaborating with council and social services, great. How do we fund the way? That's a really good reflection. Uh, as we draw up to the end of our hour together, um, we just really want to say thank you to everyone who's participated in this. We are really grateful for all of you who've come online to be with us for the knowledge that you bring into this space, um, both um, the Food Secure Communities team, Neil and the rest of them, and Korehi Kai and my team are really happy to have conversations about all of these things. So please feel free to get in touch with us if you feel like um, you'd really love to kind of explore this a bit more or you want to you want to tease out some of the questions you have um, or you've got some particular burning issues that you think aren't being paid attention to so do please feel free to get in touch with us anytime you like um, and thank you especially to Helen and to Eddie for the wisdom and the insights that you have brought to us today 
um, for your care of your people, for the teams that sit around you that allow you to do what you do and for your willingness to be in this space, not just for a moment, but in the long term so that we might actually see the change that we believe in. Uh, we know that none of us can do this on our own in the whakatauki nāi te rauru, nāku te rauru, ka ora ai te iwi really comes to mind that this is about us having what we have and doing the thing we have to offer, not all doing the same thing, but complementing each other so that we can build something that's different than what we currently have. Um, so thank you for all that you've brought into this space. Mm. And as we mentioned, this is really an introductory webinar. It's really just starting to explore what food insecurity looks like and what food security might look like for our communities. And over the next um, series of webinars that will roll out every two months, um, we'll go deeper into some of these topics. Um, so do stay connected with us. Um, as we mentioned, this uh, webinar is recorded and we'll send a link out uh, to all you who have attended or, or have registered for this. Uh, we'll also send it out through our newsletter. So if you would like to um, sign up to our newsletter, it's a good way to keep in touch with all that's happening within MSD Food Secure Communities team. And if I can, I'll just bring up the link, which you can go to um, in order to find where to sign up. There we go, magical. That's the link there, that's the web page. So you can see previous editions of our newsletter and you can follow the link here in order to sign up. And that'll just, yeah, keep you in touch uh, with all the goings on. Uh, you'll also find information there and in future newsletters about um, another funding round that we are planning. It's called the Food Secure Communities Implementation Fund. And the focus of that will be um, implementing some food security projects uh, within communities. Um, so that's a really cool opportunity. Details still to come. Um, so do keep in touch about that. Um, thank you all again for attending. Uh, thank you all uh, for your interest in the space. Um, uh, with so many passionate people across our country who are committed uh, to serving people, serving their communities and exploring what food security looks like. And we're passionate about supporting that. We just want to finish with uh, Karakia to close, uh, which is quite a famous one, so you may not. Kia hora, tia marino. Kia whakapapa, paunamu tia moana. Hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai. Tātou i a tātou katoa. Humia, huia. Tākie. May peace be widespread, may the sea be like Ponamu, a pathway for us all today. May we give and receive unconditional love to each other. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.